Well, we moved full time down to Florida now. And, um, you know, it's busy, like having to get rid of a house and stuff and, um, you know, pack, unpack all that kind of the stuff. But I'm all right. I did a dumb thing. I, I mean, when I got my booster shot, it wasn't my fault. But, you know, we have now in us most people have accessibility to the third booster shot i'm not sure how it is quite in africa yet do not get it i had no problem with with the one and the two and then i got the second this this booster thing and no i had no side effects for me the one you know until the booster shot and then i got out of bed to get up in the middle of the night I had vertigo. I was so dizzy and I was trying to make it to the bathroom <laughs> and I passed out and I fell on the floor. Oh. And so then I cracked my head open. And so I've got makeup on. This is all black and blue, but I got my, I just got my stitches taken out there. So oh. I have my war wounds. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I, I never had any headache or any pain or anything like that, but you asked how I was and I'm, feeling just fine mm. how are you i'm doing well i'm actually doing this interview for the first time this year so i'm really excited oh. well, yeah. what an honor to be your first guest of the year yeah but the funny thing is you don't look old you don't age i don't know what you feed your body but all seems good on your side it's called clean living. I, I, I mean, which is not always, not always the case, but I'm making a concerted effort, you know, no alcohol. Cause I just, you know, I wake up in the morning, I'll feel it. I'm like, oh, you know, so no alcohol I'm trying to, you know, exercise every day, the stuff that we're supposed to do. Right. <laughs> Okay, okay. So for today, we'll, we're going to make it short. I only have six questions. Some of those questions are from your book. I was currently okay. reading your book in preparation for the interview. And then yeah. we'll just do the a, a brief live chat, uh, market analysis of your most recent trade, and then we'll call it an interview. Yeah. Right. So let me first of all read out your trading bio for anyone who might be watching this for the first time. And it's tr truly an honor to have you again. So Linda began her professional trading career in 1981, making markets in options as a member of two exchanges. She became a registered CTA in 1992. Since then, she's been the principal trader for several hedge funds and started her own hedge fund in 2002, for which she was the CPO. Linda's hedge fund was ranked 17th out of 4,500 for best five-year performance by Barclays Hedge, and her early successes were recognized by Jack Schwager in his renowned Market Wizard series. Linda retired as a CPO and CTA in 2015. However, she continues to trade every day for her own account, the same managed money program she's been trading since 1992. In the world of professional trading and money management, Linda stands out from the crowd for three factors. And those are performance, longevity, and consistency. Linda, we've, we've interviewed you a couple of times before. Uh, maybe you can just refresh our memories on the asset classes that you trade presently. I do 99% futures. I trade some stocks, but not always successfully because you can only do so many things well, right? So I always do best in the futures. I like trading the currencies, um, but you know, it's all the dollar cross. So I would trade the yen, the Aussie, the EC, but I do it in the futures market. So not the spot Forex market, but I mean, it's still a universal language, right? Yeah, absolutely. So. And then early on in your trading career from your book, Trading Sardines, after owing uh, your clearing firm some money, you went on to, uh, to borrow money from your grandpa for relief. No, he wouldn't, he wouldn't give me any money. No, I didn't. I, I wouldn't. It's like, no, no, no. You figure it out on your own. So, yeah. 
So you thought that he would actually bail you out because that's the person who actually had the kind of money that you'd be looking for at that time. And he told you that you, you got yourself into that mess and you'd be the one to take yourself out of that mess. So mm. at that time, how did you how did you process that and how are you able to get back into the trading business? Well, you know, you just, the clearing firm wanted their money because they were the one that, you know, were in debt. So they hooked me up with another trader who was in New York who needed somebody to be on the trading floor in San Francisco and execute these arbitrage strategies. Mm -hmm. So that's how I stayed in business. And he paid me a salary, which was not very great, you know, <laughs> but then I'd take run around and do the, you know, the business. And then I would give half of my salary to the clearing firm. And then that took a, a five years to pay that off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So everybody starts off and there's pros and cons to, if you make money right away, then you get overconfident and on the other hand, if you have these stumbling blocks along the way, it's going to make you number one, much more respectful of the market. And number two, you know, if you stick with it, then you really have to apply yourself and work hard just to, you know, overcome the the lack of experience is what it comes down to. I think everybody's smart and everybody can study charts and technical analysis, but in the big scheme of things, experience really counts for a lot, you know, seeing and feeling the conditions in bull markets, bear markets, all different types of conditions. So, um, you know, I guess I just got lucky in terms of, you know, the fact that the clearing firm wanted their money back. So, it, you know, it worked out, but it was a grind. I was not a very happy person. The first seven or eight years of my trading career it was not, not so much fun. Yes. Okay. And then you later found yourself at the Philadelphia exchange and, in, right. and there's a chapter that you titled pipeline to God. And you wrote that at the end of the day, it comes down to staying in the game. And then you speak on, on your trading philosophy and you say that after that, I adopted the philosophy that trading has little to do with brains because of a thinking marks things up. Um, like just building on what you said, everyone can study the charts and technical analysis. So maybe you can give us more insights into that statement that well, everybody wants to think that they can analyze fundamentals and understand the macro game, which is a very different type of, um, you know, trading, investing. And so I find that with the actual trading part, it's very much like if you've played poker or card games, you know, the, it is all about capital preservation and staying in the game until you just happen to be dealt a really great hand of cards. And even if you're dealt a great hand of cards, there's still no guarantee that you'll win. But that's what I mean by, you know, the capital reserva preservation and then managing the game until yes you do get lucky you get a good hand of cards dealt to you because we can't force it you know the market has its own mind as to the conditions that it's going to you know unfold so okay okay yeah. and then uh, maybe you can touch on humility and because you traded through black monday the crash of 1987 and then you said um, in one of your chapters that, uh, let me just get that excerpt. That I was young and resilient, but more importantly, after seven years of trading, I was still green and unjaded. Life was an adventure. My movies all had happy endings. 
This was just another incident where I had to make one more stagecoach escape. I was idealistic, but not yet cynical. So that was when th you traded through the crash of 1987. And really the market did what it had to do. But with still seven years in the game, you still considered yourself as green and unjaded. Yeah. yeah. It's well, yeah, you know, it's um I think your perspective when you're young and you don't have family responsibilities life is still a bit of an adventure. Even though I was in this dig, a big hole that I dug for myself, um, you know, you're still, I think, in a better frame of mind to take one day at a time and stay in the present instead of stressing, oh my gosh, what's going to happen a month from now? Or also, you can't look back. You can't say, oh, I have regrets that I did that. I mean, you, you can't be that type of person that looks one minute back and says, I could have done things differently because it's not going to serve you and it's going to cause stress in your mind. Of course, it's important to um, analyze, you know, what did you overlook in your analysis? Um, how, you know, was there a better way you could manage the trade, but that's a whole different mindset than saying, oh, I regret this, or I should have, would have, could have, you know, and that really is true in anything in life, you know, so um, it's always futures markets are about looking for the next day, always looking forward. They're not looking in the past. And you know, the people that are best at analyzing the past data make great scientists, lab technicians, they're happier in that type of field, you see. So different people are actually happier in different types of fields and everybody thinks that they want to be a trader. But, um, you know, you have to be happy dealing with the future and uncertainties and probabilities and that type of construct, you see. So um, at any rate, that's how I've handled uh, past events that are event risk where you have gaps or stressors that we can't control because we can control stress in our life in certain areas. And then there's other areas like a tsunami or an earthquake or so, you know, some other outside event we can't control. And in those cases, you just have to say, okay, how do I take that next step forward? So um, that's what I did in that particular case. And sometimes it's, it's a blur for a couple of days. All right. Yeah. All right. So as you prepare to maybe take us uh, through your most recent trades, it can be one or two, and then you can visually illustrate to us how you actually trade. Uh, maybe you can tell us because now you're speaking to a generation where some of the people who are trading started off like you on the floor of an exchange. And then there are others in our generation like uh, Gen Z who actually trade online. So what what would you say are the main differences? And especially with little barriers to entry in trading. I remember one time we interviewed you and you told us um, that there's less barriers of entry in the sense that you just need a, a, maybe a computer, a internet connection, trading capital and a trading platform. But how does someone in our generation actually become a long-term trader like you are? Well, I think that the style of trading from the trading floor is completely different than um, the way I've operated the last three decades because I left the trading floor in 1987. And so actually the end of 1986. So it's a very different space. And the best thing about the trading floor was that you had camaraderie from other people, not always friendly, you know, <laughs> not always friendly, but uh, you could just observe how other people, you know, 
treated the profession, but I think that anybody upstairs, including myself from 1987 onwards, for me, it's very much a technical game and it's more strategic and developing a strategy or what is your style? What is your play? Do you like to day trade? Do you like to work just one pattern? Do you stay on a five minute chart? Do you look at a bigger picture thing? And you can't trade so many markets, but what is the, you know, what are the few markets that do best for you? And I think these rules apply regardless of you know, the past experience that you've had and basic technical analysis. Um, I actually have two books. I, I always go back and review books, you know, just periodically just looking for nuggets. So, oh, wait, hold with me. I've got them in the other room. Hang on. Okay. Oh, I thought I thought I brought them in here, but um, it's uh, Richard Arms wrote a book on uh, uh, trading with volume, and it was I don't know maybe it came out in 1980 something like that. So I love the books that are you know from 30 years ago, 40 years ago, where people wrote their observations before we had computers. And so he's been sort of a father of technical analysis in one regards. And um, just talking about something as simple as chart formations, you know, and that sometimes when you have a chart formation, the markets, you know, testing up, testing down, testing up, testing down, trying to, you know, reach a value level, an equilibrium point. And then, um, you know, the moves out of those chart formations lead to a different type of style, you know, hopefully a trend. And of course, some fail as well. You know, you can have a lot of uh, false breakouts and we can't always predict which are going to be the false breakouts or not, but it's part of the game. And so you have to understand that, you know, if it's a breakout trade, then maybe 50% are going to fail. But you also know that if you do that trade, you know, 500 times, your winners will be bigger than the losers. So you have to have that type of mindset. And then you can look at it as a numbers game without like the ego involved thinking, oh, I shoulda, woulda, coulda, you know, how did I not see that coming? These little voices in people's head that do so much harm because they destroy your confidence and they're always putting in seeds of doubt. But it, again, back to playing cards or a different game, you know, different poker games, I, which I don't play poker, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I know that if you're always dealt a certain hand, you know, I don't know, three kings and blah, 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 maybe, maybe. 65% of the time you can win the pot, but you're not always going to. Somebody could be bluffing, you know, there's all these other things. So it's just, um, you know, you have to treat trading in the same light. Okay, I'm going to, you know, I'll give you a bad example, buy a 20 day high or sell a 20 day low and how you manage that. Well, maybe sometimes it'll give you you know, a nice follow through push down and other times it might be just a boink boink, right? So, um, but I know that a certain number of times it's gonna do enough to make sure that it covers the losses from the boink boinks. So that might be one very simplistic type of strategy that really doesn't matter if you are on the floor or not. It comes down to, um, you know, studying charts, studying charts, and the experience part comes into play when you're looking at the, at the price action and you're saying, okay, this is how I'm going to manage these types of trades. 
or this is what it looks like when it's really a good trade. I've got that increase in that volume and that range expansion and that impulsive you know, behavior and the price moves relatively quickly. So that's where then the experience comes up. And uh, I, I'm pretty basic in my analysis. I don't do Fibonacci or, you know, I don't know, a lot of other goofy things. I just, you, I think you can do a lot just by um, looking at bar charts and some trend lines. I like the horizontal lines that mark off support and resistance areas. And sometimes you can mark off a trading range. And once it moves out of that, it'll give you like, you know, twice the move. I mean, just general guidelines, but, you know, it's not a black and white game for sure. All right. All right. Maybe you can just take us through one of your most recent trades and then we can conclude Let today's me see. Okay. So if I want to share screen. Yeah. Let me give you access. Screen sharing. Okay. Let me give you access to share screen. Yeah. Okay, can you see my screen? It should be of the Mexican peso. I picked a yeah. currency because I haven't really been trading the currencies um, that much lately. There's been a lot of interesting movement in the energies, the crude oil and the um, metals, and um, also, you know, the index futures. But I thought that I know you have a lot of people that trade Forex, probably not the peso. So I wanted to show you uh, one good, you know, one a uh, trade that worked very well. And then another time that, that it just, you know, gave limited results. So this is a daily chart of the Mexican peso. And then here, I just put up a 240 minute chart with some, just some volume distribution. So you can see that right here at this line, do you see my cursor okay? Sure. So, oh, yeah. Okay. So this would be where you had a lot of trading. I don't normally keep this uh, volume profile up, but some, some people find it helpful. So, um, and then this is just daily candlesticks with a 20 period moving average and a five period simple moving average. Um, and this here, right at the very bottom just shows every time it closed above that five period simple moving average. So all it is is a difference between a one period moving average and a five period moving average. So it's a different way of displaying this type of data right here. And um, I traded this two times. And the only reason I'm really mentioning it is because I posted it on Twitter, you know? <laughs> so it's like, I didn't want to make up a good trade or anything. And I actually exited this trade today, but I, I traded it twice. And um, I think it was, here was, uh, it looked like it had done a failure right here, just testing that previous high there. And I don't know how well you can see this or if it's coming through. This to me just had a really nice sort of pattern. I'm not into the head and shoulders type of stuff, but this was a big swing up. And this just looked like a nice washout trap to the downside. So I really like to see the traps and the flushes. I wasn't buying it down here. I wasn't really even paying attention to it. Um, but then this was a really nice pullback and I haven't, I honestly, I, I, I mean, I've made three trades in this in my life, so I'm not an active trader in this, but it was a good example. And it just looked ripe just for the, you know, everything, the swing to turn up again. So I'm very much a swing type of person. Let me just show you if, if I just take off and, uh, you know, just um, I'm just going to put up one indicator because a lot of a lot of software programs have this um, zigzag function, if you will, and it makes it so that you can see it's the same thing you see of the 
red down, green up, red down, green up. Okay, that's how I operate. I, it's how I define structure. And so anytime you see an upswing like this, that's greater than the previous downswing and, um, and the previous upswing, you see? So it's a nice change in character there. So I have an upswing that's bigger than the previous upswing and bigger than the previous downswing. And this type of pullback then sets up a very high probability trade. Of course, you don't know what you're going to get. You know, you don't know if it's going to make a lower high or a higher high. But this just was such a um, an important level here, just because we backed off several times here around the same level. So this one, I'm like, you know, I think it's going to go through it this time. And the weeklies, sometimes I like looking at the weeklies and I'm like, well, that's not half bad there on a weekly chart. You know, it had uh, this really pretty nice oscillator pullback right here on the weekly chart. So sometimes the oscillators just can, you know, um, simplify what's there in the chart. So this pullback here on this weeklies was this swing right here. So um, I like that the momentum still going up, the oscillator pulls back. So um, I hadn't bought it. I never buy the lows. <laughs> And I never sell the highs, but I just thought this looks really interesting. So I put on a trade. Um, I think it was right here, this upside breakout bar. I like the little daily patterns where you have sort of this three bar cluster. You see, you got one inside day, two inside day. So that's a pretty good breakout pattern just for, you know, in one day out the next. And so I did that. I, I bought it on this day. And then I sold it out the next day. I like that rhythm a lot. And then it um, it just you know comes consolidated here with this noisy stuff. And then I have a another pattern: eat the tail. Okay, so I like like it when you have these tails and a lot of times these tails will then get filled. So a tail on a candlestick is either going to be a test reject, like this tail here was a test reject which sets up a launch in the other direction and then here this we started to trade back up into that tail so that's an eat the tail pattern and there's pretty good odds that it's going to then take out that high um not always of course but the a high percentage of the time and then um it, you know, it was kind of grind. I held on to this one a little bit longer. And uh, part of the reason was it started to travel up this five period simple moving average. And then uh, today, you know, I was still long it and I was feeling mighty perky. And I actually posted uh, this follow up to Twitter, <laughs> probably when it was at the high. That's the problem with posting on Twitter. Everybody likes to post the charts and we don't post the exits. So, um, because you're usually too busy getting out of the damn thing, you know? So uh, you'll find that a lot of times when people put charts up on Twitter, it's usually the trades already passed, but this was follow up because I had uh, done that before. So I, I'm flat it now. I think it's still a good market. It just might need a little bit of work up here. And as long as you can see this nice chart formation here on this 240 minute. So I like to draw boxes around these trading ranges. This is a 240 minute. And uh, even though it did the test reject here and came back in, as long as it really holds in this level here, I, I think it'll still be a channeling market. And of course, if it drops below this level, the middle of the trading range there, if something comes back to the middle of the trading range after these false breakouts, pretty good odds it's going to come and test the lower end of the range. So that's my very simplistic analysis and that's um, a process of very much taking it one day at a time and then there was another market which i was um i had been i bought it yesterday this was the australian dollar okay and um i think 
I don't know if I mentioned this on Twitter or not. Maybe this was the one I posted. Of course, whatever I post is going to be bad. So never listen to anybody else's work. Okay, guys. But I bought it yesterday because you see it had this down one to, I like this pattern on the two period rate of change. So when it pulls back, it's just giving a little pullback. So I, I bought it on this day. I don't buy the low. I didn't buy, I bought it somewhere in here, somewhere not great, but uh, the play was that you got some range expansion so pretty high odds that it was going to trade above the high so when i came in this morning um you know i was i was um i'm just going to take this little zigzag off here um i was like you know this this um weekly chart here has a bit of potential just because I liked this down trending channel. Of course, it hasn't broken it yet to the upside, minor details, but you know, it might need to do a little bit more work in here. That's the problem with weekly charts is we think that we want them to work out the next day and it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Five days make one lousy bar there. So I thought this was kind of a nice corrective channel here. Um, and as it was a lot of times in these trading ranges, uh, these, we call them bracketing markets because you're always testing up and down and then you watch these previous highs. And uh, when I, I was long this, but when I saw it not really be able to hold that uh, previous high, I, I just dumped it. So it was a small trade only, it had potential. And now if I just go over and I look at this structure here on the 240 minute, you don't like to see stuff have these big bars up and then the big bars down. You want to see something is like a, uh, uh, you know, see this has a really tricky way of doing that. That's just the way this market behaves. But you really want to see a big bar up and it hold it. You don't like to see it take out the low of a big bar. That's not very encouraging. So here you see it took out the low of this big bar up and then it still had downside follow through because then what that means is that this big bar up was some buying climax. Okay. So it's after a buy climax, you know, um, you tend to get, you know, a little bit of wave, you know, zigzagging down. You know, so that's the problem with buying climaxes is that we want it to go back up there. Say, oh, wait, I really want to go back out. This could be a pullback that I could get in, but it usually doesn't work that way. That was a buy climax, so a little bit of a trap. So now you see two examples where, you know, I'm playing a game. I've got the weeklies in mind. Um, the uh, Mexican peso had a little bit better uh, legs underneath it there. So let me just show you so you can compare the two because this is always important the structures never the same on uh on these things here but um let's see here oh, we've got this bonds up pretty strong silver's up 36 gold's up 16 hmm what are those russians up to i don't know <laughs> hmm Okay, it's just, you know, there's always going to be something that's, that's another thing. Remember, I don't know if you remember, what was it? Uh, uh, oh, 12 years ago, there was the Arab Spring, there's da 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 da, you know, there's always stuff going on. So that's just the way the world works. And so, you know, the market was ready for corrective action, even without all this Russia stuff, you know, we had been losing momentum and breadth in the equity markets for a while. And I think people got very used to just trading the long side. So then that makes it difficult when you have these, what's effectively a state change. So now I, okay, now I've got two comparative charts. So here's the Mexican peso and here's the Australian dollar. And the Mexican peso had just a little bit more 
beneath it. You see that feeling? So you're not really picking bottoms or anything, but it had a little bit more of a basing type of thing. This isn't an obvious type of base, but because it just is a lot of uh, noise and volatility there, but it had a little bit more work done underneath it, whereas uh, this just didn't quite have that same amount of work done underneath it. So that's just a compare and contrast in two trades. And uh, one led to a very small win and the other one uh, I, I exited. But I think, I think you can still trade this to the upside. I mean, I'll still be looking for another spot just because you've got all these levels up here now. It's not a very pretty chart by any means. And I doubt many people in your neck of the woods would look at that peso. But <laughs> anyway, yeah. there you go. Thank you so much, Linda. At least for this, for the people who would be viewing the this interview, they've come out with something uh, that they can apply in their own trading. And I truly, truly appreciate you. And um, if people really wish to learn more about Linda, there's a book that she wrote. It's called Trading Sagins. Uh, I actually have a hard copy now, Linda. Uh, let me oh, try and see. Yeah. Yes. So guys can get that book. And then also, Linda, you can, I know there's a contact registration page for people wishing to reach out to you on your website. Maybe you can mention that and tell them if their classes with Damon are still ongoing as we conclude. Yeah, you know, I have a YouTube channel. So if you just Google Linda Rashke YouTube, I have so many uh, YouTube videos out there for free. I mean, a lot of just really good, solid information for free, you know. <laughs> so take advantage of that. All right, all right. So Linda, I'm sure we'll be having you on uh, next time. I truly appreciate you always coming on board and sharing your trading knowledge with us. And so for that, I'll say good night for you. And uh, for me, I'll, I'll go for my morning run now. Oh my gosh, and I'm gonna go to bed. <laughs> yeah. Are you still bicycling? No, I just do morning runs and a lot of walks on the weekends. So in nature yeah you know it is important that's you know you have to have some balance in life and they say that like nature is just so rejuvenating the trees the flowers the grass and animals you know if you can find a way to incorporate something like that in your life you know it it's not only good physically but you know mentally so absolutely all right. All right. Until next time, Linda, it's it's a temporary goodbye. Bye-bye. All right. Cheers. Bye.